You've made Thank some you. potentially extraordinary discoveries here, linking blood type to your susceptibility yep. to COVID-19. Talk to us about what you found. What we found, we're really grateful because our customers really rose to the challenge and they contributed to this research. So 750,000 customers took this survey. We have over 12,000 people who said that they were had, had COVID-19. Um, 2,000 of them said that they were hospitalized. So we were able to analyze this data. We found that the O blood type actually looks like it's protective. It's not a huge increase in protectivity, but it's nine to 18% less likely to, to be infected and be severe. So it's an important step. And I wanna emphasize like, there's more research to be found here, which is part of the reason why we're still enrolling people in this study. We are offered, you know, for over, we're giving away 10,000 kits for anybody who has been hospitalized, who had COVID-19, in part because I really believe we have the potential to find, you know, genetic associations that will help us know who's the most vulnerable and then can we do more to potentially protect those people. So it's obviously good news if you're type O, and I know it is very early, but have you found any clues, uh, you know, showcasing any trends for other blood types? I mean, anything preliminary? It looks like the other blood types, again, O looks like it's you have a decreased risk and the others all look relatively similar. So the, the important thing with biology and science is first trying to understand why is it that O looks like it's potentially protective in some ways or get, again, you have less of a risk. Um, so understanding that biology and then will that help translate into, you know, a genetic test that would help be able to identify people to say, hey, you should really be more protective or help in, in vaccine discovery or in drug discovery in any way. Now, what's so interesting about COVID is that it can spread so fast undetected, which means some people get very sick and many people don't get sick at all. And the question of the hour is why? You know, genes and your research indicates that um, genes can, can very much play a role here. Are there any other clues about the role that your own genetics can play? That, well, that's exactly what we're looking for and looking to see, you know, the asymptomatics would be really interesting. And that's why we're giving away kits because those people are so hard to find. So we're saying anyone who's, whether they're a customer or not, can participate in this kind of research. And I just want to add most, a lot of infectious diseases. So things like norovirus, which is known as the cruise ship virus, there are genetic mutations that say these individuals are significantly less likely to get the disease. Even things like HIV, there's mutations that say people are significantly less likely to be infected with HIV who have this mutation. So we're looking for that kind of mutation that would help people understand whether or not they, they're potentially you know, significantly less at risk for getting infected. Now, most of the studies so far have had a few thousand participants. Your study involved you know, hundreds of thousands of participants and still there's more work to do. So how do you go from a hunch to actionable information? I think the main, the, like I said, the main, I'm really proud of my customers really, again, stepped up and rallied and the hundred, hundreds of thousands, 750,000 people took this survey and it shows the power of actually having a community like 23andMe. But at the same time, one thing I do need is more customers who have been hospitalized. So there's a period of time, like it, we, we need to make more discoveries. The scientific community needs to vet it. They need to understand the biology around it. And I think over time, this will absolutely start to get integrated into how we're managing COVID-19. But it'll take a little bit of time. So and the first for us is making sure that we have more people who actually had, were, were diagnosed and hospitalized with COVID-19. So how do you imagine using this information? Are you exploring any potential drug development as a result of it? We are not. We made a decision that infectious diseases is not something that 23andMe has the, the team for, um, the, the background. So we are not pursuing that. We're absolutely happy to work with partners who potentially are pursuing that. Um, we're eager to say we're going to you know, collaborate with the academic world and are there partners potentially where it's useful for the drug discovery or vaccine development world. I think the nice thing that's happened so, here, the, yeah, the science world has come together. 
So would you look at or explore collaborations with drug makers in some way, and what might that involve? Well, we have a broad collaboration right now with GSK. So GSK has been our partner. We signed this in 2018, specifically looking at you know, drug discovery from, from the 23andMe community. So that would be our first group. And GSK actually announced that they have a large partnership. So again, it's not, it hasn't, the first step for us as a company is to, you know, put out this announcement and we put out the, we felt the rush because it's so important for our customers. Second for us is to publish this in a peer reviewed journal and then look to see, are there people who want to partner with us around vaccine development or drug discovery? Now, there are other companies looking into what your blood can tell you about COVID as well, specifically how severely you do get sick if you contract the disease. Mm -hmm. You know, how could that research sort of fit into what you're also doing? And as you mentioned, the scientific community coming together, is that something that you're watching as well? I think as we as we build up the community of customers, like one thing again we've been able to do with our customers is reach out again and go back to them. So for instance, if another team found that there was a protein biomarker or something else in the environment that we wanted to test, we could potentially reach out to our customers and see if we could collaborate there. So it's really it's it's early days, but it's exciting that this blood type looks so real, that it really there is a reason why O type seems to be, you know, you are less susceptible to developing COVID-19 because of this blood type. So we will absolutely start to collaborate if there's something that we can do. But the next step for us focusing on it is continuing to pursue genetic findings. And we can do that when we get more data. Meantime, the government has to clear the way in order to make sure that scientists make progress, that uh, vaccines are developed. We know, and I know you've had your own experience with U.S. bureaucracy and the FDA. How confident are you that the Trump administration can clear the hurdles that need to be cleared in order to make real progress as fast as it needs to be made in the middle of a pandemic? I think that I, I, we've had a lot of experience now working with the FDA, and the one thing that I would ta that I've taken away is that the FDA is filled with people who are incredibly talented, and they can react at the appropriate times. And vaccine development is again, there's all kinds of data out there about it. Normally takes a while, so everyone is rushing. But also, the worst thing would be to put out a vaccine that wasn't safe and it wasn't effective. So there's a balance between the speed, but also the need to actually have a product that works. So I believe the FDA absolutely has that ability and they've been really responsive with groups in terms of partnering about what is the, what's the most appropriate way to move forward.